All right, I think we should um, get started. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Heidi Larson. I'm chairing this session on vaccine apathy, and hopefully you will not be apathetic when you <laughs> are done. We hope to energize a different thinking about vaccination. Um, we're primarily focused uh, on thinking about adult vaccination, but in the context of uh, a life course of vaccination. Uh, and we have a great start to the panel with uh, Professor Horst Ver von Bernuth, who, to complement the lifelong approach, is a pediatrician and will uh, tell us, um, talk about the whole spectrum and set the stage for the rest of the Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to talk on a panel about adult vaccination as a pediatrician. Um, and I would like to kick off um, with a slide about the history of vaccination, which for sure did not stop in 1980. But um, if you go back to a historical perspective, we had uh, about 400,000 deaths by smallpox in Europe uh, back in the 18th century. And the first vaccination at least installed in Germany was a compulsory one, and that was done by the French, who did not introduce vaccination against smallpox in France, but in Germany, in Bavaria, which was reigned by a brother of Napoleon I. So they were, they were not so sure about whether compulsory vaccination is a good idea, so they started to check this um, in Germany, which was by this time conquered by the French. Um, in 1874, and that was a big success, so smallpox uh, went down in, in Bavaria. In 1874, that was three years after the German Reich was founded, um, compulsory vaccination against smallpox uh, was installed in the whole of the Deutsche Reich. Um, you know the history, 1967, the launch of the worldwide campaign for the eradication of smallpox, and um, that 1977, already 10 years later, the last case, the last patient with smallpox was documented, and another three years later, WHO could announce the eradication of smallpox. So if vaccination is such a success, um, why um, do we have these troubles? And for example, um, many public health people, many public health colleagues say that the vaccination against measles is probably the best buy in public health. A vaccination costs you nothing compared to the benefits um, we could have. Still, we have about uh, 10 to 15 deaths per hour from measles. Um, we are struggling to get herd immunity, which would protect not only people that are vaccinated, but as you all know, herd immunity would, vac would, would protect non-vaccinated infants and immune deficient patients. And for measles, we would need a vaccination coverage of a little bit about 95% probably. And we are way, 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 way far from this goal. And we have nevertheless regular measles outbreaks. We had one in California and Disneyland. We had one huge outbreak here in Berlin two years ago. Why do we have this? Um, and I'm coming back to a German survey when about 3,000, not about, but exactly 3,000 parents were asked about their attitudes towards vaccination and why don't you have your child vaccinated. And for me, it was very interesting to learn that about two-thirds of parents say, I won't have my child vaccinated or I didn't have it vaccinated. Oh, oops, I just forgot to make an appointment. Um, I was too busy. And that actually means that vaccinations are victims of their success. Measles are not on the screen as a threat. Polio is not on the screen as a threat, and so on. So this becomes, in, in busy family life, just simply not a high priority. So two-thirds, it's simply no recall, no, well, I forgot it. Another third actually says, I'm not fully convinced. In general, I have nothing against vaccination, but I would kind of modify the schedule. I'm not convinced about vaccination X, Y, Z. So this third could be convinced by good arguments. And only 1% in Germany, so this is 30 out of 3,000 families, parents, are 
fully convinced that vaccination is evil, I won't have my child vaccinated. So these are, in my opinion, um, very important facts to remember when it comes to the point, why do actually adults don't have themselves vaccinated? And to be honest, I don't know because I'm a pediatrician and I'm not aware of any survey. But knowing that usually parents are adults, I would make the claim or the hypothesis that adults pretty much the same don't have themselves vaccinated out of I forgot it, it's not important, and I have, I'm a little bit skeptic, but that only a small minority of adults would be really opposing vaccination. So what should you do with this? Um, in my opinion, we could, um, we could challenge these two-thirds of people um, with simple recall. We must install recall systems on the general pediatrician basis, on the general practitioner basis. People must be recalled to be vaccinated. And the ones who are not fully convinced, we must actually put in a few very simple messages. And one message would be that vaccinations with non-living vaccines won't harm anybody. The second, that vaccinations with living vaccines may harm in very, very, very rare cases. So my second like is not only pediatric infectious diseases, but pediatric immunology. And I would never go and say, well, listen, vaccination against measles is completely safe. We know about very rare inborn primary immune deficiencies that would harm people who are vaccinated with measles. So don't lie to people, but just say that the odds are very low to suffer from measles by vaccinations but that the odds to suffer from measles wild type virus are much higher and may harm much more. And something we tend to forget in Germany, in my opinion, is to say your vaccination is going to protect others. Um, we, we think that our society is such an individual one, focused on the individual, and I would make the claim that, like in Sweden, like in Scandinavia, Get yourself vaccinated and protect people who are infants who can't be vaccinated. Get yourself vaccinated and protect your co-citizen who can't be vaccinated because he's on immunosuppressive drugs or under chemotherapy. That is good. Do it. Okay. So how to address overcome barriers? It's very, very simple. Um, we have to do recall and information, and we have to do recall and information live long. We don't have to do it only for the pediatricians. Why don't we have a recall and um, a compulsory recall when we enter university? Why aren't employees asking for the vaccination status? That shouldn't be so terribly complicated and could be very beneficial. So my hypothesis is that instead of implementing compulsory vaccination programs, I would like to have something implemented which I would call lifelong compulsory recall information. And I think this could be very, very beneficial towards the goal of really installing herd immunity throughout a lifelong perspective. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much. Um, one of the things uh, that we're going to be looking at in the course of the panel is the scope of reasons that people uh, are very confident or not uh, about vaccines. Um, and I think this was touched on a little bit on the I forgot, I'm not convinced. And I was on one of the SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization at WHO, who recognized a few years ago that the issue of uh, apathy, of, of less confidence and less acceptance of vaccine was becoming quite a global concern. Uh, there was an advisory group set up and one of the asks, aside from looking at the determinants and strategies that are out there, was to define it. And in the definition of what we framed as vaccine hesitancy, 
we looked at three domains, and I think it was touched on very well in the first presentation. Complacency, the uh, I, I'm not convinced. Convenience, it's not I forgot or it's too far away or I have six other children and I don't have time to take the other. So complacency, convenience, confidence. I'm not sure if it's safe. Um, I don't know if I trust it. Uh, I don't trust the authorities. So these three domains, uh, there are more, but uh, Pauline uh, will talk about it uh, further later. But let's uh, move on and introduce um, our next speaker, uh, Dr. Doug Tuff from uh, Johns Hopkins. And he will, he's a behavioral economist, which is a very important um, angle and, and approach to understanding vaccines because if the economists, typically quantitative uh, discipline, can figure out that people's behavior is non-rational, I think it's high time that the uh, medical science community that also can be very quantitative gets, t draws from that approach. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Larson, uh, for that uh, introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Doug, and I'm a behavioral economist. Uh, and it's a, it's a good time to be a behavioral economist. Uh, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002. Uh, but he was a behavioral psychologist, so that was a little strange. Uh, in, uh, it was a little strange. Uh, but this year, Richard Thaler from the University of Chicago won the Nobel Prize in economics, and he's one of the founders of behavioral economics, so that was great to see. And then if that doesn't convince you, then there is a, a, uh, an author, Michael Lewis, uh, who's a popular author who wrote, wrote such things as Moneyball and The Big Short, uh, just published a book called the, Un the Undoing Project, which was a, uh, uh, a description of the uh, professional uh, uh, marriage, if you will, of Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. And for a popular writer like him to find two uh, behavioral psychologists to be interesting, I find just to be just fascinating. Uh, by the way, he thinks there's a movie in it, so that's a little peculiar. Anyway, uh, as Dr. Larson mentioned, uh, I think we're going to hear a lot of uh, complementarity of what, we, uh, of what we talked about. And what Dr. Von Bermuth uh, had mentioned, I think we're going to see that as well come up in what I'm going to be uh, talking about. And, uh, and in a sense, what we're, I guess what we're looking at in this panel uh, is different perspectives on vaccines, uh, why people uh, avoid vaccines when all of the evidence said that they should, uh, they, they should take them. And in a sense, well, I guess what we're looking at is multiple ways to come at the same issue. And I think what we're going to find is that there's no one approach that's going to work, whether it's from a behavioral economics lens or from a clinical lens or whatever. But that's, uh, uh, we should pay attention to all these. Now, there are a whole variety of concepts in behavioral economics. Behavioral economics has only been around for about 30 years. And as a result, probably half of what we think we know in behavioral economics in 15 years we're going to find out yeah, that didn't work at all. But I think there are a couple of robust concepts in behavioral economics that are going to be useful for our discussion here. Uh, the first one is loss aversion, which has the uh, astounding result that people don't like to lose. Now, that may be a shock to some of you, but I mean, uh, uh, people have made a career in behavioral economics d describing that people hate to lose. But the more important thing here is not only do people hate to lose, they really, really, really hate to lose. And you can actually quantify it in a sense that on average, people hate to lose about twice as much as they, as they like to win. So if you, if you were somehow able to measure how much would you gain if you got X, if you got X, and then if you ask them, suppose you had X and you lost X, how much worse that it made you off, you would find that people would think they say that they'd made, be made twice as worse off if you took X away than if you gave X. So that's going to be important here as we think about are we taking away things uh, to, to people for, for, uh, uh, that are going to make them uh, avoid vaccinations 
or can we frame things so that what they're looking at is what they think are gains? That, that, that gets to the second concept, which is framing. And framing, again, is an astounding uh, result that uh, the, uh, how you present options to people will be important in terms of what decisions they actually make. Well, marketers have known this for decades and centuries, that if they emphasize the benefits and don't talk about the, the costs, then people will, will frame their particular product in a particular way. And this is going to be important in vaccinations because uh, depending on how you frame it, whether this is going to be a, a, a benefit or a, a cost is going to be important. The third thing that's going to be a uh, useful concept in behavioral economics is cognitive biases. Uh, one of the things that behavioral uh, psychologists have discovered is that people have used heuristics, that is sort of rules of thumb, and this leads them to come up with a whole variety of conceptual uh, of biases. Um, if, you looked at, if you looked at the font of all wisdom, which we all know is Wikipedia, uh, if you looked up cognitive biases, uh, and, and you can probably do it right now, I won't mind, uh, list of cognitive biases, what you'll see is a list of 92 cognitive biases. Well, there aren't 92 cognitive biases, we just haven't been able to figure out what the two or three or four actually are. But, it, but, the, but the important thing here is that these biases can, can lead us in particular ways uh, with respect to vaccines. For, for, uh, for example, there is something called present bias, that people prefer the present to the future and will make it, and, which is obvious, but once they get to that future, they will come to regret the decisions that they make. I mean, as a result, they may decide, I don't want a, vac I don't want a vaccine, I don't want to take the time, it might be painful, I don't want to give my kid one because, as Dr. Larson had mentioned, I've already got six kids, do I really need to take the seventh? Uh, I've got a lot of things to do here. And, uh, and so what they will do is to say, well, we won't do it, or we'll do it tomorrow, and tomorrow sort of never comes. So those, that's an example. And then the last one that, that's important is system one versus system two thinking. And this is one of the things that Daniel Kahneman really brought up in his master work, Thinking uh, fast, uh, fast and Slow, in which he described essentially, uh, uh, obviously, uh, uh, he, he realized and, and said that this is an oversimplification uh, of how people think, but broadly, two different types of thinking. System two is what economists, standard economists, think that this is how people think. They're deliberate. They think about it a lot. They go through a logical process in making the decision. It takes them some time. And then if you ask them later, how did you make that decision, they can tell you this is how they made the decision. Then there's system one. System one is what often is called intuitive thinking. It's also quick. Uh, it's, uh, it involves parallel processing. And the decision, may, uh, the, the decision um, is really opaque. People can't tell you how did they make the decision. It's, it just felt right, right. So you've got these two different things. You've got system two, which is very deductive, deliberate, da, 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 and then you've got system one. Well, you might, you might ask, well, why, doesn't people, why don't people use system two all the time? And the answer, as Kahneman describes it, is pretty simple. One is that system two takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of energy. If we spent our entire day thinking in system two format, we'd never get through our day. A wonderful example of that, not in, really in healthcare, is learning is driving. When you learn to drive, you know, think about when you learn to drive. I mean, you had all this information coming in. You were spending all your time, I mean, just trying to keep the car on the road uh, and, and worried about the kid who was running across the, the street, the car that was behind you, the car that was coming up on you, and all this. Now think about how you drive a car. And I can, I can probably imagine that most of you can recall a time where you've been driving for about 10 or 15 minutes and you realize that you haven't really been paying attention for all that time. How in the world can you do that? And the way you can do that is because you're using system one. It's very simple, it's straightforward, and, and you've got a lot of experience on it. Where that comes to, to, play, uh, comes to bear in this particular issue is wonderfully uh, described by a terrific book by Sendel Molly Nathan at Harvard and Elder Shafir at Princeton an ISOLA book called Scarcity, in which they were talking that, uh, that people have limited uh, mental bandwidths. And when you have scarce time or scarce money, that bandwidth gets narrower and narrower. 
and, and you spend your time just looking at whatever that is, and, and you also spend a lot of time on system one. And we can talk about how that affects uh, vaccines in, in a few minutes. So. Uh, one of my colleagues at, at Hopkins, actually he's a postdoctoral fellow at the Berman Institute, uh, Yashar Sagai, had this wonderful taxonomy of, 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 of decision making in healthcare and also decision making in, in uh, behavioral economics. And you can see those, those seven things there. For an interest of time and I think relevance, I really want to just talk about uh, uh, three of them. The first is education and persuasion. This is kind of the go-to response from public health professionals. And it's like, if people only stood, understood that, dot, 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 then they would do the right thing. Well, education and persuasion tool uh, assumes rationality and assumes that people are using system two thinking. There is nothing wrong with that. It certainly will, uh, it certainly will work. But suppose that people are spending most of their life in system one. Suppose that they're using emotions, not rationality, in making their decision. How are, in the, how are they going to be processing uh, this education? And multiple research studies have demonstrated that if people hold an incorrect or, or inaccurate belief that providing contrary information is actually going to strengthen their incorrect or inaccurate belief. So for the 1% that, that Dr. von Bermuth uh, was talking about, Giving them education is not going to convince them at all. In fact, it's going to make them stronger. But for those who haven't really thought about it, or the one-third that he described, who said, well, I'm not quite sure, I need more information, education and persuasion would be a, uh, would be a great thing. Okay. Then there's penalties and reward. Oops, 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 no, don't look at that. That's my... Uh, penalties and rewards. This is the go-to response by mainstream economists that it assumes that people are rational and they've got this utility function in their head and they're making calculations all the time of benefit cost analyses for every single thing that they do. Uh, and as a result, if you gave them a reward and said, we will pay you uh, if you uh, get a vaccine, then they will respond. Or if you penalize somebody, if they don't get a, a vaccine or have their child get a vaccine, then they will respond. And there are some evidence that those, that those will, will actually work, but not entirely. Then you've got default, and default is the go-to approach for behavioral economics. Uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler wrote a famous book called Nudge, in which they describe uh, how defaults can be extremely powerful. And one of the examples they use is uh, uh, in, in, in Belgium, 99% uh, of adults are, or, are registered as organ donors, but right next door in the Netherlands, it's only 27%. Why that difference? Well, that difference is that in the Netherlands, that's an opt-in state, where if you want to be an organ donor, you have to check a box, sign your name, and then you're an organ donor. In Belgium, it's an opt-out state, where you are assumed to be an organ donor unless you check a box, sign your name, and then you're no longer an organ donor. One of the things that uh, Sunstein and Thaler uh, have, have discovered is that those def setting the default can be extraordinarily powerful. And so one of the things they suggest is if you want people to do something, then you modify what they call the choice architecture. You change the environment. You make it easy for people to make a decision. And you create an opt-out versus an opt-in situation. Well, how would you do that in vaccines? Well, one of the things you might do, in, in, in Dr. Von uh, Vermeer's uh, example, two-thirds of people have said, you know, I, just, I just, di just didn't think about it. Well, instead of, just, instead of doing that, and, and in addition to giving them education, how, how about uh, providing vaccines in workplaces, schools, markets, make it free. They're already there. They don't have to do anything. It's come get your, uh, uh, your don't even come get your vaccination. We're coming to your office and we're going to vaccinate you. Now, one of the wonderful things about that is then it, it kind of establishes a social norm that everyone in this organization gets vaccinated. You should too. Now, again, it's not going to convince everybody. There are going to be people who won't want it for a whole variety of reasons, both good reasons and not good reasons. But it will, I would think, would dramatically increase the, uh, the amount of opt-outs. 
And then there's the final one, which, which Dr. von Bermuth also mentioned, which actually he did compulsion and, and, um, uh, and coercion, but also uh, mandates. And mandates are sort of the go-to approach for advocates of government intervention. Uh, and you can have hard mandates versus soft mandates. A hard mandate would be you must be vaccinated as a requirement for going to school, uh, having employment, or being a citizen in the country with no opt-outs whatsoever. It could also be what I would call a soft mandate, which would be a requirement you must get va vaccinated, but without any enforcement which is kind of like a little nudge past a, uh, a default uh, uh, kind of approach. And in the United States, for example, most people pay their taxes, even though they know they will never get audited. Uh, and, and, and they do that just because it's a social norm. Um, and so if we created a social norm that everybody gets vaccinated, then that will, uh, uh, that will affect things. Now, the success or failure of this in endeavor it really is going to be uh, dependent on, on how we frame it. Because you, as you frame it that we are, uh, we are making our children safer, that's probably going to be much more successful than, than having people think that, well, they're mandating it, they're making me do it, they're limiting my choice. And by doing so, it's going to be, it's going to be problematic. So those are the, oops, yeah, those are the, uh, 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 my sort of thoughts on behavioral economics. A couple of caveats here. You already saw that one that I'm, uh, I'll try to bring up again to get the laugh. Uh, but there are a couple things. One is there's a prominent individual in the United States whose name is on a lot of hotels uh, who said a couple of months ago that nobody knew how complicated health care could be. Combine that with Murray Gell-Mann, uh, uh, who won the Nobel, Laure uh, Nobel Prize in Physics in 1969, Think how hard physics would be if particles could think. What we have here is particles that, uh, particles that think. And the important part there is that I think we're going to find that no one approach is going, to, uh, is going to work. And even if we had one approach that work, it, it would work, it wouldn't work all the time because what we have here is particles that, that can think. Uh, but we've got to do our best in trying to figure out how we get, get these thinking particles to do what, not what we think is a good thing to do, but what ultimately they think is a good thing to do. Thanks. Thanks very much. That was very <laughs> helpful framing. And I've read The Undoing Project, and it's a brilliant book. Um, I'm not sure about the movie, but let's wait and see. <laughs> Um, the next uh, speaker is Paul, Dr. Pauline Patterson. Uh, Pauline uh, co-directs with me the Vaccine Confidence Project, uh, which we uh, run out of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Pauline's an epidemiologist, but our team is pretty multidisciplinary. We have psychologists, political scientists. We don't have a behavioral economist, communications expert, but it just speaks to how many domains uh, this issue really needs to try to understand it better. Um, Pauline will tell you more. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, the website address is thevaccineconfidence.org if you'd like to find out more information. Um, so while most people vaccinate, some groups or individuals delay or refuse vaccines, as you've seen. Um, when someone is deciding whether or not to vaccinate, they need to be confident, so they need to trust the vaccine, they need to trust the provider, they need to see a perceived need for the vaccine. So if you don't think that, for example, measles is a serious disease, you're less likely to want to vaccinate your child against measles. And, and also it needs to be convenient, so you need to have access to the vaccine. Um, studies have shown that you can intend to vaccinate, but not actually go and vaccinate. That's an extra, an extra level that needs to happen. What drives low vaccine confidence? The safety concerns. So if people think the vaccine causes um, adverse events, then they might be less likely to want to vaccinate. Um, and for example, if a teenage daughter gets vaccinated and then a few weeks later has seizures, although it's not the vaccine, the, because it's temporally associated, then um, the mother and the teenage daughter may think that it's linked to the vaccine. Um, also, there's uncertainty about real vaccine risks. 
With vaccines, you're vaccinating healthy people and children, healthy people, healthy adults. And so there's less risk tolerance than medicines where you're already ill, you're, um, you're feeling ill enough that you don't mind if the medicine's gonna give you a side effect, but with a vaccine, you're less likely to want to take a, a risk. Um, as I was saying before, so uh, there's distrust in not just the vaccine or providers, but some people don't trust the information and where the information is coming from, or the system, or, or the science. And, and in terms of tensions between individual rights versus wider societal rights, this happens more with mandatory vaccination, where someone thinks, well, my child's not gonna get flu, they've never had flu before, why should I be forced to vaccinate my child in order to protect someone else? So some people have that view that they want to protect themselves, they want to protect their family, but not necessarily protect, do it for the public good. And then we've also seen philosophical or religious beliefs, though some vaccines contain components that are not compatible with religious beliefs. Uh, the, the, group, the Vaccine Confidence Project and Gallup Orb International conducted a survey in 67 countries to try and identify the state of vaccine confidence globally. And this was with over 65,000 individuals, and it was done in 2015. In this survey, there were these four questions that were on a Likert scale from I strongly agree to I strongly disagree. And so the first component, vaccines are important for children to have. Overall, I think vaccines are safe. Overall, I think vaccines are effective and vaccines are compatible with my religious beliefs. And this is just giving you a glimpse of the data that we um, analyzed. So this uh, figure here shows you overall, I think vaccines are safe. Now dark red is where people strongly agree that vaccines are safe. Blue, they strongly disagree. And here, as you can see, France, uh, a lot of people don't agree that vaccines are safe. And, and also the European region had the highest negative responses for importance and effectiveness as well. What can you do with this information? So we, we spoke with uh, delegates in France and, and they were aware they had an issue, but then this survey gives more of a comparison so you can, countries can see how they're doing compared to other countries. It can be used as an indicator of what's going on and, and we're intending on carrying out a further survey so we can see over time what is happening. And here I thought, since we're in Germany, let's see how, how Germany's doing and, and pr pretty well. Um, in the team, we carried out a review on vaccine hesitancy in healthcare providers. And what we found were, as other studies have shown, healthcare providers remain the most trusted advisor of health information and uh, influencer of vaccine decisions although the confidence and capacity of healthcare providers is stretched, and so they need more support to manage the evolving environment and in order to address the questioning and concerns around vaccines. Uh, healthcare providers themselves, uh, there are some that are hesitant to vaccinate themselves, and, and reasons for this, we've, we've discussed a few of these. So healthcare providers, some, for example, with the flu vaccine, don't think it's effective, because it's an annual vaccine, some seasons the vaccine has been a bit less effective, so healthcare providers are less likely to want it the next year. Uh, some healthcare providers are worried about safety with the vaccine, also a lack of perceived need. Some healthcare providers think, I'm not susceptible to influenza, and if I get it, I won't be that ill. So some aren't vaccinating for that, or they don't have the time. But what we've seen is that vaccinated healthcare providers are more likely to recommend vaccination. And practices with positive attitudes about vaccines have higher vaccination rates in their patients. And also healthcare providers with increased awareness, knowledge about vaccines are more willing, willing to recommend vaccines. Some healthcare providers don't want to talk about HPV vaccine because they don't know, first of all, they feel a bit awkward with the conversation about human papillomavirus and how it's acquired but also they don't know how to uh, answer questions if parents have questions. And so they're less likely to recommend it, for example. And also what we found is societal endorsement support from colleagues to vaccinate is important. Uh, interventions we found that are if, if effective at increasing vaccination healthcare providers to address these concerns that we've seen. So if the vaccine's free, 
healthcare providers are more likely to vaccinate. If there's easy access, so such as uh, mobile health clinics, so if there's a clinic that comes to see you in whatever hospital you're working at, at a convenient time, you're more likely to get vaccinated. Educational activities in order to inform and educate about the importance of the severity of the disease. Also, if um, the flu vaccine is shown as a preventative, so vaccination as a preventative tool, so rather than occupational health, but more let's prevent disease, that works, and reminders or incentives. I saw one hospital had an incentive, which was a raffle and you could win a holiday. I thought that's quite, that, I guess it works, but it just seems a bit strange to me. Um, Opt-outs, mandatory immunizations have been shown to increase coverage, although it may increase coverage, but does it increase confidence? And peer vaccination. So if your peer is vaccinating you, you're more likely to vaccinate as a healthcare provider. Um, we carried out a review on strategies to address hesitancy in the public. And what we saw there was that effective strategies include social mobilization, mass media, going back to healthcare workers, communication tool-based training, non-financial incentives, and reminder recall-based interventions for those parents or adults that just have forgotten or they don't know when, it, when their vaccine's due. Strategies that are multi-component, dialogue-based, tend to perform better, but as a result, less have been evaluated for effectiveness because it's really tricky to evaluate a multi-component intervention for effectiveness and tease out what's effective and what's not. This was a study done in the US by Doug Opel, and the, the brink of it is that if uh, this is about doctors, providers, nurses talking to parents about childhood vaccination. So if the doctor starts with, it's time to start all those vaccines, we're going to be doing the MMR chickenpox. Then 74% vaccinated. These were video consultations, this study. Whereas if, if the provider started with, how do you feel about vaccination? Only 4% vaccinated. That's a big difference. There have been studies showing that if the healthcare provider recommends it, but it's also about how, how you go about starting that conversation. There, are, there is some guidance and communication-based tools out there to help healthcare providers and also public health bod bodies related to addressing vaccine hesitancy, but there could be more, and this is an example of one. This is an ECDC, and it's talking about addressing misconceptions on measles vaccination. So, when you talk about a myth, uh, the, the studies have shown that you need to start by saying, I'm about to say a myth. If you start with vaccines don't cause autism, the reader will come out and go, oh, I'm not sure about vaccines. So you need to start by saying, what I'm about to say is a myth. And then, so that's the explicit warning. And then there's a gap that needs to be filled, a knowledge gap. So then you need to fill that gap of, okay, so if that's a myth, then what is causing autism, for example? Graphs work better than text. And then also this, it's really interesting, careful language. Moderate language is the way to go. If you use a strong negation, people increase their perceived risk of the vaccine, although you're saying it's not the vaccine. If you use very strong language, people come out with a high risk perception. So communication will not fix a problem you do not understand. You need to identify the susceptible population groups, so the groups that aren't vaccinating and are susceptible to the vaccine preventable disease. Then once you've identified the group, it's important to to conduct qualitative studies to understand what are the drivers and barriers of immunization, and then design and evaluate evidence-based interventions in order to tailor that. And here, additional training and support it is helpful to aid healthcare providers in addressing vaccine hesitancy, and building or sustaining trust between healthcare providers, health authorities, policymakers, through more shared involvement in the establishment of vaccine recommendations. For healthcare providers, they are the, most, uh, the public's most trusted source of health information. So I would recommend that they engage with their patients, listen, but also discuss with questions, like answer questions, talk with your patients in the time you have. Acknowledge questions and concerns. So don't brush off questions as trivial because they're, they're real. These concerns are real, so they need to be acknowledged. And then recommend vaccination. Thank you. Thanks, Pauline. 
I just want to reiterate the importance of the empathy and the listening because I think one of the, the big things that we uh, have seen again and again uh, is the fact that people who may be hesitant and may have some very genuine questions, you're a young parent or it's a new vaccine, um, or if they have a question are feeling very uh, brushed off or patronized. And I think that um, we've made a lot of assumptions about the public's willingness to take vaccines. And I think uh, it's a bit of payback time and they wanna have more involvement, more dialogue. And that's a big, big lesson is communications is as much about listening as, as uh, com communicating information. For our last speaker, before we um, launch into the discussion, which uh, I'm glad our speakers have all kept on time so we can hear from the audience. Um, Jane uh, Barrett is a, the Secretary General of the International Federation of Aging. Um, I recently was involved with a workshop she convened and I, it was fascinating some of the things I hadn't thought of um, in aging in terms of different different things going on in your life which you see a bit more of every day but um, but when we talk about aging uh, technically we're aging from the minute we're born we're just more conscious of it as we get older I think um, but in adults we've got young adults we have pregnant adults we have uh, parents who are adults, we have health workers who are adults, and then we have people who are retiring adults and second career adults. So there's a huge diversity in there, um, and Jane's gonna speak to some of it, and then we can launch into a discussion of these issues in the life course, but with particular attention to this time. Thanks, Jane. Thanks very much, Heidi. Good afternoon. Um, as Heidi said, I head up an international organisation called the International Federation on Ageing. And for the past five years, we've been committed to working at a national level, but also regional level, to understand some of the barriers um, that prevent older people from accessing vaccines. And I think when we talk about vaccine hesitancy, we cannot have an independent conversation without looking at the systems in which vaccines are improved, appro approved. So initially I want to really give you some context, you know, the climate in which governments are making decisions. So w the world now is undergoing the most significant demographic transformation in its history. And it's the interrelationship between longevity and fertility urbanisation and migration together are powerful forces that are shaping our demographic transition. They're incredible challenges and while they're not insurmountable, um, they really form almost the underpinnings of decisions that government make around healthcare for dollars. And while I don't want to be cynical, if I look at population ageing, um, Quite often, governments see it as all about the numbers and all about the bottom line. So let's first of all talking, talk about population ageing. You know, in any instant, under any circumstances, all we can say is that population, population ageing is happening all around the world. In Europe, we know that population ageing has occurred much faster than what it's occurring in least developed countries. Also, we can say that there is a definite shift to the less developed countries. So we know that India will overtake China as the most densely populated country in the world within the next 10 years. We can also say something about where people are living. In 1950, 30% of the world's population lived in urban areas. Today, 50%. 2050, 66% of us will live in urban areas. So you've got population ageing, the demographic upheaval of urbanisation and migration. Each of these facets of demographic upheavals actually contribute to the ground on which government make decisions. 
And when we turn to migration, North America and Europe comprise 15% of the total population, the total world's population, and yet they are home to 50% of the international world migration. One of the greatest max, m mass exodus in our history happened in 2015, when over a million Syrians moved to Europe. And in just that context, you know, we must look at the influence this migration has on communicable diseases and infectious diseases. And in each European country, how we assess the infectious disease rate and how we actually understand what kind of vaccines are required across the life course. I now just want to touch on some terminology around the older population. And while we, always would, we would all like to say that ageing starts at birth, and it does, you know, governments and we as individuals have certain almost arbitrary cut-off dates, cut-off ages in our lifespan. You know, that age of 60 or 65, that age of 75, which is called old, old, and that cut-off point of 85, which is called the oldest old. And I was asked a question this morning about, do you think ageism impacts on decisions around vaccine? Well, yes, it does, to the extent that um, different vaccine schedules for adults have different cut-off points. So in some countries, it's 65 years of age to have the pneumococcal vaccine. And for some countries, it's 75. And there's a big question in one of the meetings that I presented at whether was it worth actually vaccinating someone who was 85? Now, when I have an infectious disease specialist ask that question, we actually have to all sit back and recognise that many of us here today will live into our 70s, 80s, 90s, and some of you will all hit 100. Now, how do you want to live when you're 100 or 80 or 70? You want to live healthily. And what we maintain is that public health campaigns and strategies need to be much more broad and comprehensive and include adult vaccines. But only if those adult vaccines are not only affordable, but accessible. And I was fascinated with some of the presenters today, you know, about the barriers. You know, there's a particular country where an older person goes to the doctor if the conversation with the healthcare professionals touches on vaccines, and that may not happen because some incentivization means that you have to go back for another appointment because the doctor can only talk about one disease at one appointment. So if we have the conversation and there is agreement that a vaccine is required, then that person has to go away, go to the pharmacy, then come back and make another appointment. Now, I'm not sure about busy people and busy lives, but just the inconvenience, and that word came up, this inconvenience. We also know that there are some fine examples around the world where uptake rates are actually very high. So Hong Kong is a very good example. 80% of all people in residential care are vaccinated. Now, why would that be so? Because there is mandatory vaccination. However, we've also got to consider the uptake rates of vaccination for healthcare professionals. And while I certainly acknowledge from Pauline's presentation, you know, the hesitancy in healthcare providers being vaccinated, one of the very reasons is because, why do I need to be vaccinated? Because I'm healthy, aren't I? You know, this myth that we are healthy, therefore we don't need to be vaccinated against shingles, against pneumonia, against influenza, um, you know, against pertussis. So there's a very real questions about our attitude to ourselves and our own mortality and immortality. So when I think about this slide, which talks about creating dependency and putting pressure on increasing fewer working group, you know, this is a relatively recent slide. And what's missing here is where we are today, where older people 
are being asked to remain in the workforce. People are choosing to remain in the workforce past 64, into 70 and sometimes 80. So this whole dependency ratio is outdated and yet we're still using this kind of thinking about the value of an older person in our society. We look at economic analysis, but we rarely look at the social and economic contribution of an older person. What's that contribution where an older person is actually volunteering, being a mentor, staying in the workforce, doing the grandparenting, volunteering? Very few studies look at that. So we need to go beyond the old terminology and move to the current situation with population ageing, urbanisation, migration, and then look at that contribution that older people are making right now. And a study in the uh, United Kingdom says it very well. In one year, £61 billion older people in the United Kingdom contribute to society. I now just want to move on to what I think is the new frontier of understanding the social and economic consequences of not being vaccinated. So we do know that people at risk are in their older age groups, but we also know that those at greater risk have non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, lung disease, cancer, asthma. But what we've always thought was community acquired pneumonia is an acute disease, an acute episode. But just recent work out of the University of Kentucky suggests that's not the case. So in the work by uh, Pirani and uh, Ramirez, you know, what they've hypothesised from reviewing many articles is that patient 50 with a life expectancy developed an episode of pneumonia. What happens is after hospital discharge, that patient moves to a life expectancy of 60 years of age. Why? Because they have an underlying comorbidity, let's say of heart disease. But what happens within 12 months of that is that this person actually, through the infection of the pneumonia, the chronic inflammation actually exacerbates the current comorbidity and leads to death within 12 months. Now this, I think, is where we need to be starting to think about research going forward. This is not a unique episode that we're looking at. This is an underlying condition that will impact the life expectancy, but also the quality of life and healthy ageing. And that's why we're so interested in this field, because we need to create an environment for older people that enables them to do what they value, not what we think that they value. So just coming to the end now, I want to go back, loop back into this healthy ageing. We also know that you know, the trajectory in the last part of our life can often go in three different ways. We can be that person, that person A. That person A who is high stable capacity, you know, we have intrinsic capacity, all of those physical, emotional, psychological capacities within ourselves, and the decisions that we've made about lifestyle early in our life have been in our favour. So no smoking, moderate drinking, active exercise, lifestyle. And then we could think about that person who has a declining capacity, and that person would be likely to be in an assisted living capacity. But then we look at that person where their intrinsic capacity has actually diminished, but you can see that their functional capacity still has been optimised. My question to you is, in each of these three trajectories, pretending that you're in A or B or C, do you have the right to have access to affordable vaccines? Does it mean that this is going to start being an ethical question? You know, or does it mean that we need more evidence around whether it's the chronological age where we decide vaccine schedules, 
or it's the immunological age? These are questions that I'm not able to answer, but I'm sure some of my colleagues will hear. So fundamentally, you know, adult vaccines are part of a broader, more comprehensive public health strategy. Adult vaccines are part of a life course approach and they need to be intrinsic in our thinking about how we grow older in a healthy way. So some take home messages. Life course approach to vaccination I've already mentioned. Special attention is required to that at risk adult group those with NCDs, which are increasing rapidly. We must challenge this notion of ageism and age discrimination, and it's insidious in nature, and we experience it every day. The IFA brings together unlike. So in our expert meetings, we have infectious disease specialists, public health agencies, patient groups, NGOs, academics, government, because together we need to understand not only what the barriers are, and they may be physical or they may be behavioural, but really how to work together to get to the goal. I have this belief that we're using completely the wrong narrative around adult vaccination. You know, in a country like Canada that has access to many vaccines that are reimbursable, the uptake rate is relatively low. So when I see it's flu season, go and get your flu vaccine, there's no wonder why people are not rushing to the door. We do not understand the consequences both to ourselves and to those around us. And until we actually rigorously study the narrative and the messages, not only the nature of the message, but the pipelines we use to receive the message that then takes us into action, we'll still be talking about this in 10 years' time. I look forward to the discussion and thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Jane. That was, um, I think, framed the issues in, uh, in an important way. Also, I think the framing of it in the context of a life course, just health in general and, and rethinking issues of dignity, uh, productivity, uh, and healthy aging and, and lifestyle. Um, I know that we've seen also the impact of vaccination both by young children for, the, uh, for aging as well as for the adults. I think when, when children, young children are vaccinated against pneumonia, there's a dramatic uh, drop in the incidence of pneumonia among uh, parents and grandparents because of the herd immunity. And I think when we can do that at both, both ends of the life course, we'll have a much healthier population in general. Uh, where it can be uh, vaccinated against. I think right now the best is to open to questions and, and discussion. If I can see. <laughs> Are there any, does anyone want to start? Yes, thanks. Hi, my name is Frédéric Dardel. I, I come from the, the blue country, uh, France. Um, Welcome. Um, recently, the, the French uh, Minister for Health uh, made uh, vaccination for... Uh, in the past, there were three obligate vaccinations for, for children. Now it's 11 since a few, a few weeks. And that has had a huge effect on the community. You, you say that information is important to try and convince people who are reluctant to get vaccination. But what we are facing now in, in a country like France is an alternate uh, pathway of information going through social networks. And it, it was a huge Twitter storm after the, they made the uh, vaccination compulsory. Uh, about And all the anti-vaccine movement was extremely active. So in, we have to take that into account 
when we try to convince people is that there is a lot of information, or non-information actually, going on, on uh, parallel networks that actually completely negates the effect or the, the positive effect that we're trying to promote. So it's making our lives very difficult because uh, it, it's over and it comes over and over again. And it's not system, system one, the system two thinking, it's system one, actually. The appeal to emotions, to things like that. And the fact that um, nobody remembers what it is like to have the polio or something like that is, is the sense that no, the future now, the, the, the present or the, lo the sense of loss is not present. So it's, it making, it's making our life very difficult. So when we, have, when we try to communicate about trying to convince people, we have to take into account that there is all this network of uh, parallel information which is not Wikipedia, which is very bad for us. That's, that's just a comment I want to make. I don't know whether you, you have thought of that in your, in your strategies, but we're facing that uh, really in France at the moment. Uh, I don't know whether it's, it's going to make a big difference, but it's, it's difficult for us to, to try and promote vaccination. So what we're saying is communication will not solve a problem you don't understand. And also, as we saw, if a, proportion, a high proportion of the population think vaccines aren't safe, then mandating vaccination is, is, is expected to cause an issue, right? So David Salisbury at Public Health England did some studies looking at if people perceive the vaccine to be a risk, then communicating the disease as a risk actually creates decision conflict and then people don't know what to do. So, yeah, it's not necessarily the, the right thing to mandate, in, in my opinion. Thank you for your question. I think it's, it's a very important in the context of our world today. An example from Australia, which, which touches in a different way. You know, several years ago, there were two babes who died of pertussis in weeks of one another. And the Prime Minister, within two weeks, decided that um, there would be a no pay, no jab policy. It's called no pay, no jab. So there was no jab, no pay. Same difference. Um, no jab, no pay. Um, so, you know, I, I think what we need to understand is what's the most appropriate response to the issues you know, at, the, at the country level. But I think social media, we need to, we need to understand how to play the game. Um, one thing that struck me was something you said that people don't know what polio was like because they've never seen it. Uh, one of the things D.A. Henderson, who's the uh, now late uh, dean of the School of Public Health, who led the effort to eradicate smallpox, uh, apparently once said, no one ever thanks him, no, no one ever comes up and thanks him that they haven't died uh, of the smallpox because they don't think about it. It's just, it, there's no salience to it. But what's salient is, is, in a sense, the autism that supposedly was caused by a, uh, 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 by a vaccination. And again, and, it, and all of the data in the world are not, is not going to uh, convince people who are already convinced that uh, autism, cause, uh, autism is called by, va by vaccinations. So in, in a sense, using social media is you're trying to change the, the, uh, uh, the frame. Uh, you're trying to change, uh, trying to get the social norm from uh, vaccines are horrible, or at least vaccines don't make any difference because no one dies of any of these diseases. Uh, to explain what the um, uh, uh, what the issues are and what, what what people sort of ought to do for their own for their own good. Now, again, as I, I had said, education and persuasion is going to help just a little bit. We we need other kinds of uh, strategies as well. Um, I, I, I lived in France for four and a half years, so I just wonder whether the rates of vaccination will raise at all, um, given the fact that now 11 vaccinations are compulsory, and knowing the French way to react with strikes, and, and, and um, I really wonder whether this will really have a good impact and a good outcome. And I would 
like to add an anecdote of two years ago. At the high peak of the measles epidemia in Berlin, measles vaccines were sold out in Berlin. So as soon as it comes back to the minds of people that measles may be harmful, people get their children vaccinated. So how could we actually reach by intelligent strategies an awareness of the risks? As soon as we had one kid died, that died of, of measles, parents were rushing to the pediatricians to get their children vaccinated without any compulsory vaccination. How do we do that without the epidemic and without the death? <laughs> that's, yeah. the, that's the, I mean, not to provoke it, but I, I understand. Um, but we also have cases like in, in England and Wales, particularly um, some of the anti-MMR groups that refused the vaccine after the Wakefield saga almost 20 years ago now, um, nearly 20 years. Um, when there was an outbreak, the hardliners were still hardliners. It was really interesting. We had expected a bit more of a shift. But getting back to the, the question of are we thinking of strategies um, to address this um, undercurrent of uh, alternative social media uh, information or misinformation um, and pretty scary information from what we've been studying. Um, I think we need to get much more awake to the fact that it's there. It's easy to uh, not pay attention to it unless you actually start looking into it. But it's pretty, it's pretty deep. Um, the other thing about social media is that it's transnational. I have a whole lecture I give on what we call digital epidemiology. And we've been tracking for the last um, several years, but particularly since the advent and ubiquitous spread of social media, how these memes, these pieces of information, particularly the negative information, are jumping continents and getting embedded in the narrative of the anti-vaccine groups, countries referring to each other, reinforcing each other. Um, and it used to be that language was the great kind of kept it local. France's issues were not the ones in England. You know, it was autism in one place, the Marisol in another, and France was all about aluminum. Um, or uh, that I know that's the big scary one, but there's a lot of other issues, clearly. Um, but thanks to Google Translate, adding that to the social media environment, and Google Translate is not a perfect translator, which adds more to the confusion. Um, it's be become a very uh, challenging environment. We see it particularly now with uh, HPV vaccination, where not only have you got parents and mums nets sharing and reinforcing each other's anxieties, you have teenage girls um, filming each other with their various uh, reactions or uh, whether psychosomatic or other, and copying those and creating groups and cohorts. It's a big problem. Uh, the World Economic Forum in 2013, uh, they do annual risk reports, and there was one that has particularly struck me, and, I, and I've used it a lot. The three top risks, one was economic risks, which we've seen plenty of. The other was digital wildfires, which is, this is a perfect example of it. But what they also added, and I think which absolutely converges around the vaccine space, is human hubris in health. The, we know better. Um, and that's not just the medical profession thinking we know better, but the general public who's decided that we know better than experts. We don't need, as we've learned in the UK, experts. Um, the man with all those hotels also doesn't think he needs experts, sadly. Um, but, um, and b somehow because it's offline or off out of the major uh, mass media space, you can, and just the whole internet environment is so unmoderated that it is a very challenging thing. So I think one thing is to get a handle on what's really there, and it's much more than you want to know about. Um, 
but at the same time we need to, and I think we also need strategies, not combative strategies. I don't think raising arms, and one, mm -hmm. one interview I did ended with, I just said, we need to put down our arms. I mean, we, this is not something where, and I think it's aggravating it, calling the anti-movement stupid people, ignorant people. And I even heard a group of women in northern Nigeria who were very anxious and concerned about the polio vaccine. And the one thing that made them even more distrusting was hearing on their local radio station that they were ignorant. And they were, they were furious. They said, we are not ignorant. If we were ignorant, we would be not questioning this vaccine. Um, and the fact that they were questioning to them was, and fair enough, I mean, it was, so uh, I don't have an easy answer to that, except we need to understand it, we need to engage with it, and I think somehow, um, and I think it starts, um, we need to start much younger. Um, we, one of the discussions we actually had in the adult vaccination workshop was the medium of communication um, at different ages, because we have, you know, what was the common mode of communication for the, uh, what do you call them, the oldest and the oldest oldest? Or in, in Japan, I think they have one term, the, the super old or the super aging or the super elderly. Um, uh, the, the medium of how people are communicating is, is quite different. So we need to understand, um, understand those different domains. Um, it's not a simple answer, and we're a bit late to get conscious of it, but anyway, thank you for raising it. Other questions? Uh, yes, thank you. Yes, <clears throat> I am also from France. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Nobody's perfect. No, no, we're very Nobody happy you're here. Very happy you're here. No, <laughs> no. you know, we face, we face an irrational field. We are on an irrational field. Because when you have in front of you uh, many, many TV uh, 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 movies, when you have in, in front of you a young lady, she told you I received hepatitis B vaccine and I'm multiple sclerosis now, because in France it was a big debate. And you have no rational answer. You say, no, we can believe me according to science. The expert is no proof the link between the vaccine and, and multiple sclerosis. But no effect, no effect at all. It's not rational. I, I don't find, and I was in front of this, on this situation, I didn't find any, any way uh, to, to discuss with these people. And the second problem, I think, is a mixture between the critics against vaccine industry and the vaccine. They say, oh, hey, the vaccine is money for the vaccine industry, and now with the, the, the new Minister of Health, they want to mandatory vaccine for relevant uh, immunization is because to, to give money to the vaccine industry and, and you know, it, no scientific arguments. It, it's why it's a mixture of, of okay, education, uh, long-term process, and, and the fear of vaccine replaces the fear of disease. This is a problem. The people, they don't know what is diphtheria, what is uh, even measles, they have forgotten completely, and polio, I don't discuss. But... Uh, I don't know what to do. And I think it's a, it, it's a very difficult situation now because the risk of uh, new outbreaks can appear any time. Uh, I, I think it's a very important, two, two points. Um, I think the only way, and we see this a lot with vaccines and autism, um, you know, separating, trying to convince parents that their child's autism was not because of a vaccine or that a young girl's uh, multiple sclerosis is not because of a vaccine. I think the only way um, we're going to be able to de-link that is when we can find, give confidence about the reason. The problem is when we're not sure. And with autism in particular, we know more with MS, but with autism, um, we're still running to catch up with it. Frankly, I think the anti-vaccine movement, if there's one thing that it's been good for, is investment in autism research. It has really <laughs> uh, 
pushed funding for autism research because I think there's an understanding that if we, you know, until we really understand it and get more information, um, it's a bit different, as I said, with MS. But um, and we've seen also to make another point related to that that these perceptions and links jump vaccines because now it's in the um, the HPV vaccine questioning circles in France. Um, it's causing uh, multiple sclerosis. So uh, the associations stick and sometimes they jump vaccines, which doesn't make it any easier. Um, so because now we've learned that the first thing we have to do is empathize. So I'm empathizing with um, the situation, but then we have to do more. But I do think that also what you say is sometimes the criticism isn't even specifically about the vaccine. It's about the industry. Uh, it's about uh, distrust in government. I mean, we talk about uh, confidence in the product, uh, the provider, and the policy or politician. Because we see at many levels, and we've seen this in a lot of research around um, some of the issues. We have a strategic partnership with Public Health England. Uh, we're kind of on call for any issues that come up, and we go in and we do some qualitative research to understand and a lot of times what we're seeing is that people really had a bad experience at that particular clinic or with a particular health provider, and it's really not the vaccine that's bugging them. It's they had a bad experience and they don't want to go back there. And that ex bad experience could have been when they took their child with a fever about something else. It wasn't even a vaccine, but they don't want to go back there for the vaccine. So I think that a, a comforting environment, an environment where they feel respected, I think dignity is a huge, huge issue for elderly as well as for, for younger ages. Um, and that respect, uh, somehow I feel that mutual respect and trust has really had a breakdown and we need to rebuild that at every level uh, from children to adult, adulthood um, because that that underlying trust can be a big issue. It wasn't an easy answer. I'm sorry, I didn't really, we're, we're really doing everything we can to understand it better, particularly in the Vaccine Confidence Project with a growing global network of researchers. I can't tell you the number of every day when we come to the office, we have people all over the world, um, immunization programs, governments, individuals, NGO, nursing associations, um, asking for help, asking what can we do? How can we measure it? How can we understand it? And then we get our share of the anti-sides too, saying we're not doing good things to the world. But um, uh, the, the Minister of Health is convening an advisory group and they have already, had already approached us to um, work with them a bit before we came out with our global study. They are trying to bring citizens in. So there is a consciousness. When the, what the Minister of Health told us was that uh, when our global study came out, you know, we knew we had a problem. One thing this global study told us, which you mentioned about Germany, was how bad it is relative to others. And I think that's a, a provoke some uh, action. Do we have other, um, yes. Sorry, I'm just saying yes because I can't see exactly. Who, um, like a blue shirt. Hello, my question goes to the last uh, presenter. Um, you had a slide in your, in your presentation um, which said that I think Europe and the U.S. or North America um, are fifth, um, contribute 15 percent to the world population, but they um, receive 50 percent of, of international immigration. Um, can you explain these numbers a little uh, more? Because I think most of, of people who, who have, have to flee or are displaced live in the same country or live, go to the countries, um, to the neighbor countries, as it happened in Syria too, where where most of the people who flee, fled from uh, Syria went to the countries around. And um, you also mentioned that um, the one million migrants which came to Europe had an effect, or, or that you told, talk, told something about the effect they have on the, on the infectious diseases and that, that it could have an effect on, these, on the treatment or on, on the vac vaccinations. Um, 
can you explain what you meant with this um, again too? Uh, because I didn't understand it uh, probably, I think. Yeah, look, thank you for your, your question. The first two um, um, figures that I've, I gave you were um, the reports that I was reading, and I can give you the reference, and I think the reference was up on the slide, was that North America and Europe constitute 15% of the world's population but have currently 50% of the international world migrants. That was the statistic that... Um, that d so that, that's, the, that's the fact that, that um, I reported. Uh, in terms of the migration process, what I was saying is that with all migration, you know, there are influences and need to look at um, the process of infectious diseases. So th it was a statement to say that, you know, in different parts of Europe... They have different systems in terms of assessing migrants and what infectious diseases that they've had or had and what vaccines they've had or had. So that was the statement. Um, I was just thinking of one other point that um, came up earlier about the mandate and going from 3 to 11. It's a bit of a leap, but 3 to 11 vaccines... One of the issues around that, um, it's, it's not specifically the mandate, but uh, a, a number of people raised what I think is a, a fair point that you can't uh, put a mandate of three vaccines that happen to be in a hexavalent vaccine which has three more vaccines in it, which effectively is making all six of them required if it's because they keep more and more vaccines are combined in into one injection, so you can't require a couple of them when you're not giving an alternative for separate. So that was one of the one of the reasons for the increase in the mandate, both in France and Italy, was to make the mandate consistent with what is being uh, provided. And and again, from the pediatric perspective, if you make only MMR mandatory and not the others you kind of tell parents, well, the other vaccines are not at all important. So, so, so one issue about compulsory vaccination or mandate vaccination is always if you only pick a few choices that you consider as very important, you actually kind of say the other vaccines are not at all important. So that's another point. I didn't raise it on, on my slides, but... That's a strong belief, at least in Germany, why should we refrain from mandate vaccination because we can impossibly mandate everything. We, we would not like to mandate, for example, rotavirus vaccination. No way, we wouldn't do it. Um, but then we should concentrate on a few and that would probably harm the others. gentleman that f from France, how many adult vaccines were approved? I mean, it's a, it's a question that, you know, we, we don't seem to be having on the table here. We're talking a lot about, you know, children and vaccines, but, you know, the conversation of what vaccines for adults and whether they're approved or not approved, and I think you said zero. I mean, doesn't that say say something I said how did you how many did you say zero so there's zero mandated mandated yep. not, not just approved yeah. yeah except um, well in France but I think the example of the residential home uh, is is one but again that's a public space I think we're the mandates are rationalized is when they have public health impact because it's like in schools and residential homes. Hospitals, I mean, I think if they're, I would imagine that in some French hospitals are health workers required, so that's a, an example. Compulsory, if you take flu vaccine, uh -huh. people after 65 years, yeah. you, you got reimbursed from the vaccine. Uh, And if you're a, a health professional, health provider in a hospital? But it's not 
Again, no, it's not, it's you not don't really lose your job. It's not really mandatory, but it's a, a strong recommendation strong, yeah. uh, in hospital for health worker, for hepatitis B and flu, yeah. and flu also. But it's not really a compulsory. So okay. only thing, they reimburse the flu vaccine after 65. So I, I think that the, the question also is, in France it's over 65, but in another country it's going to be, you know, probably different. And what we're struggling with is the lack of um, surveillance and monitoring and registers in, from country to country. So we're really not understanding what the uptake rate is. And sometimes registers, even if you have them, stop at 75 for some reason. Yes, question. Yeah. Oh, yeah, here you are, Dean. It's okay? Uh -oh. Yes, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, uh, it's Mike your Clyde. boss. You yeah, ex-boss. Yeah, ex -boss. Yeah, ex -boss. <laughs> uh, so I also am from the land of run by a hotelier. But I think when we talk about uh, recommendations versus uh, mandatory vaccines, you ha any policy, if you make a policy, you have to have a mechanism to ensure it. Right? And so for children, it's easy. The, in Maryland, for example, our child vaccination rates are over 90% because you, you can't be enrolled in school, public school, or any school, unless you have, you're vaccinated. And, and there are ways to be accepted from it, but they're, they're not easy. So, so we have very high rates. In, in our health system at Johns Hopkins, it is mandatory for healthcare workers or anybody from another school who wants to walk through the hospital to have to be vaccinated for influenza and, and we wear little tags on our on our ID tags and if you don't have the right color you're not allowed in a patient care area I, I, I don't see how we can do that aside from residential homes for for older people you know so so we'd have to think about how, if, if you wanted to have a mandatory policy for for uh, the old old or the old how how would you make that happen perhaps in the national service in UK you could do that but in many countries it would be difficult stimulate conversation because it's a conversation that we don't often have around adults, vaccines and healthy ageing. So I'm not advocating for mandatory, but you know, those recommendations, you know, if we've got a recommendation, how do we actually enable an older person, regardless of their age, because the age is not, not important, how do we enable them to have access to these vaccines? And how do we ensure that there's a a much deeper understanding of why we're being vaccinated. Uh, I'd like to channel Richard Thaler for a moment and, and go to defaults. Uh, one thing that, that uh, sort of struck me is in the US, I don't know whether this is the case uh, elsewhere, but uh, we go to the dentist twice a year. And why do we go to the dentist twice a year? Largely because the dentist says, well, I'll see you back in six months. And if, you, and if you don't think about it, you just go, oh, okay. Now, if you pushed back, then you'd have to push back against your dentist. And you've got this whole power relationship. You've also got you know, a personal relationship with the dentist. So one of the things that struck me is my, uh, uh, my internist says, well, it looks like it's time for your tetanus uh, vaccine. Oh, I mean, you haven't had a, a pneumonia vaccine. Uh, it's time for that. You want to do it right now. We can do it right. We can do it right now. And this also gets to the, the timing of it. It's not, do you want the uh, vaccine? It's that it's time for this to, to happen. But you allow, and the important thing, as, as, as Richard Thaler talks about, and as Kahneman talks about, that you've got to give people, if you're going to have, have this be a, a default, not not. Uh, mandatory, you've got to give people an out, an easy out. The chances are they're not going to take the easy out, but you've got to give them that out. Otherwise, you, you've turned a default into, into something that's mandatory. And one of the things that, that Sunstein and Thaler have found, and others have found in, in behavioral economics, is that the defaults will get you a long way. It'll, it'll not get you to 100%. It won't get you to 95%. It might get you to 90%. And if what your goal is to, in, is to increase uh, vaccination rates or adherence to anything, getting to 90% is a lot better than, than getting to 60%. Uh, 
And if, if what you're worried about is, you know, we're never going to get the last 1%, then you're going to be stuck with, well, by the way, we're, we're now stuck in the 60 to 70% range. So in, in part, I guess one of the things I'm saying is uh, use the tools that, we ha that are available to get us as far as we can without having to confront the really hard, uh, the hard core. Yes, right in the middle. Um, I, I just, while well, she's getting her microphone, the, the recommendation issue, I have an example from, from Japan, the power of recommendation, even if it's not a mandate, in Japan, uh, over four years ago now, they suspended their recommendation of the HPV vaccine because of citizen anti-advocism, anti-activism, <laughs> activism, whatever. Um, they suspended the recommendation while they investigated. They still have, they've concluded their investigation that showed no cause, but they're still have suspended it while they continue to provide it free. And they said, um, you can get it for free if you demand it, but we don't want to take the uh, responsibility of having recommended it. What did that lead to? Uptake rates, even though it was free and available through the national system, acceptance rates dropped from 76, 78 percent to 0 0.06 in some places, but an average of 1 percent. That's still freely available, provided through the system without the recommendation. It's not only that, because there's still a lot of underground meet, social media anti-activism, but that recommend, the power of that recommendation. If they said tomorrow, we're confident, all is well, recommendation back intact, I am sure that at least it would get to 50, maybe not to what it was, but um, that's a very powerful lever, even without a mandate. Um, go, yeah. We will get to your question, I'm sorry. You know, what we also need to recognise is because of that recommendation, you know, discussions around other vaccines, such as pneumococcal vaccine, has actually stalled. You know, because because of that recommendation, so it's it, it it's powerful in all sorts of ways. Your uh, question, thanks. Yeah, hello, thank you. Um, I just wanted to put on the table the um, the fact of uh, of the adult vaccination, above all in in travel vaccination. I wanted to have your opinion because I. I, uh, I'm a clinician, and I really have the the well the problem with patients uh, going to travel to some countries like Africa, and then discovering that they couldn't travel, that they couldn't enter some countries because it, they weren't vaccinated against yellow fever, for instance, and this kind of vaccinations, which nowadays have a compulsory document like a passport of vaccination, and why, if there are any measures taken. Through through this kind of uh, of um, of uh, Look, how to say it. it's it's a great question and I don't know the answer. Um, if, would you know anything about travel vaccinations? I mean, like <coughs> <laughs> see, it's not the paediatric; it's the tropical institute. Yeah. But it's a, it's a really good question in the context of more older people travelling in later life. And so it's a question that needs to be answered. Also, because we we got a problem with um, with um, salmonella vaccination with the um, um, typhoid, uh, the Bivotif is the name of the vaccine yes. in in Spain. And yeah, uh, as it's not such a good uh, vaccine, but you have both the oral and the injected vaccine. Mm. Um, the the duration is uh, about two years, some uh, more or less two three years are the last discussions. But uh, they are starting to recommend it uh, only if the travel is going to be for more than two weeks. Also because of the traveler having the impression that uh, he's uh, covered against uh, all kind of uh, possible diarrheas, but in mm. fact it's not covered uh, against giardia or another parasites. Mm. And sometimes uh, they don't they don't get that information correctly. And I don't know if you're 
um, I didn't know about your project, but if you're also considering this kind of information, mm -hmm. because like uh, afterwards, as people traveling from sure. India and coming from Th to Europe, that with, would be very helpful. Parasites. I'll contact you afterwards. Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, in principle, a lot of travel agents, travel agents should be at least encouraging travelers, um, tr ticket booking some airlines, um, because it's. In some cases, they have to take people back if they're not allowed in the country. Um, so I, I think it just, it's highly varied, but um, I think it's the kind of thing when somebody books a ticket, they should to Ouagadougou or wherever they're going for their holiday or, or work. <laughs> I mean, some organizations, certainly like in the UN, we always had, they never, we had our checklist at, at the London School, we can't go without... Um, but that's institutional. But it's not, there's no perfect system, so it's, it's a good point. Yes, in the top there. Yes, you, uh, the red, is it red? <laughs> Sorry. That's about the only thing I can see is the color. <laughs> Hi. Oh, that's loud. Okay. Um, my question has to do with scheduling of the vaccines. Can you introduce yourself? Oh, sorry. I'm um, a medicine. <laughs> sorry. I'm a medical student. I study in Germany, but I'm originally from the U.S. and I was a nurse in the U.S. Um, and I'd contact a parents in a school because I was doing school nursing there. And um, some of the problems that we ran into were that healthcare providers would provide an adjusted schedule for childhood vaccines. Um, and it was really difficult to talk to those parents about that and, you know, convince them that they should vaccinate their kids all at one time. And I guess um, my question is, how do you talk to healthcare providers about that? Or as a future doctor, how can I talk to other doctors about that or talk to parents about that? Yeah. Thank you very much. This is a great question and act actually touches on very much on empathy. So my number one answer to this would be um, take your time to talk to this healthcare provider, to this nurse or to the parent who wants to have his individualized schedule on vaccinations because these parents or these healthcare providers would fall into this one third of I'm skeptical but you can be convinced and, and my personal approach is I take an hour so if these parents of these health providers get in touch with you, take an hour of safe time, of protected time, no beeping, nothing, take an hour. You have to plan an hour of time. Can you imagine what an hour of time is for, for, for me? So, but nevertheless, if you really want to convince these parents or healthcare providers, let them talk. First of all, what are your what, wh why are you worried? What are you concerned about? What have you heard? Let them just talk. And don't start to talk too early. <laughs> yeah. because, because as soon as you start to talk, all, all this is rubbish. I mean, forget about the autism story, the Wakefield. It's, it's just awful. I was on a podium with Dr. Wakefield. And believe me, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I had difficulties to, to, to keep my temper. But... Um, all this is, like you called it, system one thinking. And, and, and you can only get from, switch from system one thinking to system two thinking um, by give these people time to feel accepted. And then make a checklist. And if it's about measles, then tell them about what you yourself, as a doctor, personally experienced by measles. And then say, well, I can understand and, and I have no clue why autism actually... And, and, and they always have the same problem you touched on. You said it's very difficult to say measles is a neurotropic virus, autism is something neurotropic, there must be something in it, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's very logical. We, we do vaccinate with measles and, and people develop autism. It's very logical, isn't it? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. 
but, but listen to it and then go point by point. And then you say, tell about what you experienced that you have. And that's not encephalitis with measles is the main problem, but the major problem is the immune suppression which goes on. And of course, many children don't have atopic eczema afterwards because they're so nicely ex immunosuppressed. But if atopic eczema is your only problem, but, but I had problems like pneumonia, it get personal. Choose personal examples. Don't draw the figures. I mean, these people are in there in a personal communication situation and, and, and try to be as personal as possible. And that's pretty tough groundwork, I guess. And, and I don't have, well, I'm the pediatrician on this panel. You guys are the public health people, but, but that's how I would approach it. just had an idea for the volunteer elderly. We need in waiting rooms someone who has time <laughs> to, to, because one of the problems, to listen, and actually I've been reading a lot of Freud lately because there's been an acceleration of HPV vaccine reactions being characterized as psychosomatic illness, so I've been reading a lot on it. And Freud had something called uh, the talking cure. I mean, he did it over months and years <laughs> with individuals. But there is, I, I think it's really, there's something very profound and very simple about it. And I think in the current day and age we're in, we've lost that talking dialogue, not, not talking like this, talking, but um, face to face listening and talk and dialogue. And I think that, and there's also at the same time for economic reasons, a lot of pressure and stress on health professionals, GPs, nurses, others, um, and they're clocked. I mean, I know in the NHS we're super stressed on time. You're in, you're out, you're, I mean, I, we've talked to some people about their views on vaccines. They say, we feel like a number. Next jab, next jab. And then they, you know, the doc gets points or incentives for immunizing as many as possible. Um, so uh, somewhere in the system, we need to give. And it may not be immediately with the time that, that you know, pediatricians and, and geriat geriatricians can provide, but can we work in a system where there's someone to talk to in waiting rooms that they are kind of hostage while they're waiting that they can go talk to? Like, you know, I don't know if you've seen in Peanuts, Lucy and her five cents, the doctor's in, you know, just to talk about what's, as someone who actually has a bit of understanding about these issues, but um, I think we also need to work with curriculums. Um, most doctors, uh, from what I understand from my uh, MD colleagues, barely any, and uh, I think, uh, Mike, you might be able to give insights on this too, from a, from a curriculum point of view, how much time do doctors actually learn about vaccinations and immunization in an MD curriculum? From what I understand, it's not much of a day, if that, and never mind knowing, and the fact that there's been so many changes and, and up, updating of schedules. And the other thing is how many medical and health professionals from nurse practitioners, um, registered nurses up to to GPs and specialists, how many of them are given any training or support on how to have a difficult conversation? Not just how do you have a difficult conversation saying you have cancer or you have HIV. I mean, that kind, there's a bit of support. But how do you have a difficult conversation with people who say, well, thanks, doc, but I don't want that vaccine. I don't want that treatment. I don't want that diagnostic um, I mean, this is vaccines are uh, in an acute situation right now, but it's not just with vaccines where there's a much more challenging questioning um, group of, of patients who have a lot more access to other information and come <coughs> often with a pile of printouts of things that 
they've learned alternative. So I think we need to work into curriculums, um, not just about more about vaccines for life, but also how can you change your dynamic in conversation to uh, one, as a, as a health practitioner, feel less confronted uh, and feel more at ease, but also how can they engage? Um, yeah, I just wanted to add three points as we were discussing. Is um, We're doing a study looking at HPV vaccine in um, the program in, in England. And what we saw, so one school nurse was saying, if they get a non-consent from a parent, they don't see it as a no, they see it as a not yet. Because in England, we vaccinate around 13 to 14 years old. And so the, the school nurse will... will call the parents up and, and speak with them and un try and understand the reasons for the no and, and explain, you know, um, if they really don't want it, let's discuss this again next year because we've got a few years for your, for your daughter to need it. And, and then in terms of, we've used the term anti-vac quite a few times, but, but when you speak to some people that are critical of vaccines, we see it as vaccine critical because they're not anti-vac because they've given their child the vaccine and then the child got ill. So they're not against vaccines. They've had questions or their child's got ill and then the questions haven't been answered or the concerns haven't been addressed. So we, and also one thing that hasn't been mentioned is the vaccine hesitancy spectrum. You have some uh, people in the population that accept all vaccines and don't really think about it at all to someone that accepts vaccines but questions but still gets vaccinated to some people that vaccinate against all, maybe delay one or two, to, to people that delay more or don't vaccinate, to people that really don't vaccinate against all vaccines. And so it's worth remembering that when we talk about this. Yes, I, I've heard some talks by Dr. Wakefield, who's also not an anti-vaccine person. It's one of the frequent things, uh, which may be <laughs> true, but it doesn't feel like that. Do we, we don't have, we just have about 10 more minutes. Um, okay, there's, yes, in the middle on the, towards the back. In my clinic, when I see a mum who doesn't want her child vaccinated, they're usually frightened. You know, they're scared for that individual child. We talk about herd immunity in vaccination. We don't talk about the individual child. And often they say to me, hey, doc, have you had your kids vaccinated? And if they, you know, I can say yes. So that, and... The other, the other point I'd like to raise is that um, our doctors of today, my students, have never seen a child with measles. Wow. I have, my generation have. I've seen kids with measles, pertussis, all those things. But the new generation of doctors haven't. So they, when they try to explain personally what a baby with pertussis looks like, they don't know. And so we've got a real um, gap in, we can talk till we're blue in the face, but seeing a baby struggling to breathe with pertussis as a, as a doctor is, is something you never forget. Thank you very much. This is an excellent point. And that's what I wanted to point out with, you have to answer personally. So take the bullet list of I'm afraid of pertussis, I'm afraid of measles, and then answer with your personal experience. And that gets very difficult if you as a student or as a young doctor never made this experience. So, well, unfortunately, I'm now something like 20 years in this business and, and, and I, I, I do run a service and I do see patients. So I can give personal examples and these do help. And then you have more to win and less to lose, maybe. Be because as soon as you know what to win, you win health against measles. You win health against pertussis. And as, as soon as you manage to get into this thinking, um, you may have a chance. My personal 
experiences as soon as you get into this conversation. I don't know what's your experience, but my experience is that 80%, 90% will have their children vaccinated in the end. As long as you get into this conversation, everything's fine. Thank you for your question. And I guess a question back to you. Do you have that same conversation with older people? Because I think the conversation with, with mothers and children you know, is, is a relatively common conversation. And I'm just wondering whether you know, the same conversation happens with you know, older adults. And just one other point is that we must remember also that the growing um, role of pharmacists as vaccinators around the world, and that's a, a very important um, profession because they're often trusted, you know, by older people, you know, because of their contact that they have. But do you have that same conversation? Hi, I'm Nora. I'm in. Okay, I'll just pass it on to you after. Uh, I'm Nora Carrara. I'm an aspiring pediatrician from Germany, and I actually have uh, two points. One question um, about to the tropical medicine per, per question. Actually, I was working at the Charité um, Travel Medicine before I started my residency, and um, which was really interesting was actually. A lot of people coming, going to these exotic places, asking for a rabies shot and yellow fever and uh, Japanese encephalitis, even though they didn't even have a tetanus shot. So, sort of what you were saying about the danger, they saw the danger, a rabid dog could bite me when I'm traveling through Thailand, so I don't want to have that because you can actually die from it. Isn't that true? So they had these stories and these questions and you had great conversations and Luckily enough, you were able to sneak in a little bit of information about, oh, by the way, your tetanus shot hasn't been updated for 20 years, so maybe you want to think about that, because that you can actually get in your own garden in Germany. So um, just, yeah, for me, it really opened my eyes to the whole awareness and seeing what perceived as dangerous and what not. And um, now as a pediatrician, um, I have a lot of international patients, obviously, in Berlin, and um, they come from different countries where there are different vaccine recommendations from the different, the CDC, the STIKO in Germany, and um, it confuses them a lot because if you've lived in America for five years and your, your schedule has been completely different, they come to Germany and now I have to tell them, well, actually, we do it this way, and then they ask me why. And I don't know, I don't work at the STIKO, you have to ask the Robert Koch Institute. But um, I, yeah, my question now, I guess, would be, do you think that a global schedule consensus might help with the confusion of the, um, the parents? Thanks. Yeah, that's something, thank you, that's something we've also seen is that that can cause questions. Why is it this age here and why is it not there and why is it compulsory here or recommended there? And, and does that mean it's not based on scientific evidence on what's the most effective way to do this? And I think it's a, it's a complex world and that's why vaccination schedules are complex. And I, I'm not sure it would be possible to coordinate it but I, that would be the ideal, would be to coordinate it, but I'm not sure if it's possible. Yeah, yeah there are efforts at harmonization, but I know, I mean, I've followed, a, looked at a couple individual vaccines across European countries, and you have 35 countries and 35 different vaccine schedules. Some of it has to do with school schedule. Some of it, frankly, it makes it difficult when you've got a family that's moved to different countries and says, well, wait a minute, you know, 
you're, you're so firm about the schedule, but where I was in X country, so there can't be any science behind this. There are, there is science to a certain extent, but then there's um, practicality and how do we, how do you make it most accessible? Um, so I think in some cases it does come come down to that. Um, also, the disease burden will differ in the different populations, so you can't have a universal um, system. Although WHO does have recommendations. Yeah. Um, there was, yes, um, one hand down here and one at the top. Wherever you're closer to the microphone, but we will. It feels like I got the Oscar right now with the microphone. <laughs> okay. I'm Tazdik from Bangladesh, and right now I'm studying global mental health, London School of Hazard, and tropical medicine. So I have a very specific query. You know that recently, for the last couple of months, uh, millions of Rohingyas have entered Bangladesh. And uh, in Bangladesh, the vaccination coverage for children is pretty impressive, and we have received so many awards for vaccination and reducing the child mortality. But we are, you know, scared right now what will, what will happen next, because we want to help the Rohingyas, definitely. We have already opened the border. But we don't know about their vaccination coverage, and we don't have any idea that what, what will happen when they will be mixed up with our population. And definitely, Myanmar is not going to take them back very soon. So what should be uh, our strategy right now to keep up the in health indicators we have right now, where we have very limited resources in hand to provide primary health care to them? Well... One, I, th I mean, the, you can look at the experience. I mean, Jordan has faced this a bit with the Syrian influx, although Syria probably had higher vaccination rates, at least before the system was destroyed. But um, I think that um, this is actually what international development and humanitarian funds are supposed to help with, um, especially when it happens from you know, one poorer country to one poorer. Um, I, I think that that's need to be weighed in from an international perspective. In terms of, I mean, there's a number of vaccines. It doesn't hurt to get twice. I think the assumption is you ask, but uh, to the extent that you can protect, um, I mean, there are certain vaccines that are considered more priority than others because of their high rates of infectiousness. Um, measles in particular um, is highly infectious so and that will quick spread quickly if that starts circulating um, and I think that there will be decisions made about that but there are guidelines on on that not that they're always followed but they can help uh, leverage what to do I, I don't know does anyone have any other relevant input for that one um, but I, you did raise, and I was thinking about this situation partly because I was speaking with Joanne Liu, who just came back from there, and uh, it's another. I think it's going to change the ratio from the 15% and 50 million in Europe with this new horrible situation there. Uh, one, there was. I'm sorry that you got. Um, we had a bit of a detour there, but. Can't Thanks. leave without. So my name is Franziska Wadenschi. I'm medical editor with Science Media Center Germany. And maybe just two comments and not questions anymore because time is already up. Um, the first thing is that we only, maybe only talked about parents who denied um, vaccinations. But what I heard so far is that there are also parents who just don't vaccinate their children or let them vaccinate it because they think if I do it or let it do and then something happens, there's a serious side effect. It's not the rush or the pain for one or two days. Then it's on purpose. I did it to my child and I did it really, um, I did harm my own child. And if it's just I don't vaccinate my child at all and then you get the flu or the measles or whatever, then it's just bad luck and not on purpose and just coincidentally and you don't have to feel ashamed as a parent. And the second remark that I would like to add is, especially in Germany, we have a problem with a gap in the vaccination status with the people in their 30s and 40s, especially with those who followed a different scheme of recommendation in the eastern part of Germany and the western part of Germany. And after the war came down and after the reunification, the scheme was newly structured, which meant there are quite a few people in this country at the moment who think they are safe 
they are fully vaccinated because they were fully vaccinated, vaccinated following the old scheme. And then they go to the doctor and the doctor may ask, um, what about your vaccinations? And they just say, I'm fine. I have all my vaccinations, but I lost my card within the few years. I move too often, so we can't look it up. And the doctor just believes it and they don't take any anti-titer status because this is quite expensive in Germany. So they don't get any vaccination, no refreshing or just to really fully coverage. So just maybe a little additional remark. Thank you. <laughs> I'll take that as a comment at this point because our time has wrapped up. They had thought it was 3.30 even, so I think there's some pressure to kind of wrap up. Anyway, thank you. This was a long session, but I, I really appreciate your being here and hope that you've had a useful discussion. Thanks very much. <laughs>